So a very big welcome to Motion 72, supporting our branches, branch resource review briefing session, uh, focusing on the branch funding formula. Um, I just want to point out now um, that uh, I am, my name is Becky, but the film is not about me. That Becky is, is not me. I've had many roles in unison mm -hmm. throughout my time as an activist, uh, and I've never been a treasurer. And uh, hats off to all of you who are, um, because it's a, it's a demanding role. Um, as I hope you'll have picked up, this session is very much targeted at those of you who'd like to know more about the funding scheme. And uh, we hope by the end of the 90 minutes that you'll feel better informed. Everything you hear today can be found in the report and Motion 72. Um, the links have been sent to you by email for those. Um, before we begin, um, we're going to be running two polls today. Uh, there'll be one now and one at the end, so please could you submit your responses when you're prompted to. Um, I'm just going to move on to some housekeeping. Um, can I remind the audience of the importance of treating each other with dignity and respect at all times? Uh, I'm expected the standard uh, to be met uh, during this meeting. The chat function has been disabled. Um, please email the facilitators in your registration email if you need to contact anybody during the event. Um, we encourage lots of contributions and we'd like to hear from as many people as we can. So uh, when we get to the Q&A part, we would ask if you can um, keep your contributions <coughs> concise and no longer than two minutes, if possible, please. Um, if you'd like to speak, um, then if you raise your hand, um, so to do that, you go to the participants area um, and the facility is within that on, uh, on the Zoom platform. And you can also use the reactions at the bottom of your screen and I'll do my very best to pick you up um, as, you, as you raise your hands or indicate. Um, we've been joined by two uh, BSL interpreters. Uh, they're Karen Green and Russ Andrews. If you'd like to use their services, please look for them in the participants list uh, and pin them to your screen. And you can do that via the participants list as well. Uh, we also have a captioning facility in Zoom. Uh, Julia Whitaker from CJ Captioning will be doing this. Um, if you're using a separate screen, use the link sent in the registration email. Uh, if you don't have it, then no problem. Um, we can send you a dedicated link now if you raise your hand uh, and indicate that you would like that. Um, so tonight we're going to have a short presentation um, and then we're going to have an opportunity for questions. We have IT support at the meeting. So anyone with issues with IT, please email again the contact details in your joining instructions. Um, just a reminder that this session is being recorded. Um, so if you're all sitting comfortably, uh, we'll begin. OK, so the purpose of this presentation is to present to you the branch funding scheme. Um, we're joined tonight by Josie Bird, who's chair of the branch resource review. Lillian Mesa, who's the Scottish Regional Convener and Vice Chair of the Review. Um, in addition, the review has been over the course of the last few months approached by activists who have posed some key questions. So um, I'm delighted that we've got uh, Rad Kerrigan from Norfolk Community Health, uh, Denise Thomas from the Community Service Group, Margaret McKee from Northern Ireland Health, Wendy Nichols from North Yorkshire Local Government have been able to join us. Uh, and I am uh, Becky Tai, uh, and I'm the regional convener for Unison Eastern Region. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Josie, uh, who's going to explain the new branch funding formula to you. Over to you, Josie. Thanks very much, Becky. I was going to say, just turn your microphone off before you do. Can you tell me if you can hear me? And if you can't, I'll yep. try Brilliant, yes, because I was yep, going to say I'll yes, fix my yep. microphone and I don't know how to, so that would have been a yep. major problem. But um, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Becky's already introduced me, and I think I've got this job tonight because I'm like Queen Stato um, in terms of the numbers and things like that. So I'm just going to take you through um, the proposed branch funding scheme and the branch funding formula. And this opening slide might be familiar to a number of people who are participating in our briefing this evening because we've used it really, I think, at almost every session that we 
we've done since the NEC agreed motion 72 um, ought to be submitted to the special delegate conference. But for those of you who might be a little bit newer to this conversation, I'm just going to quickly take you through the detail that we have. So the branch funding scheme that we're proposing, it has two elements to it. And um, the top in green, that is our proposal. And the, at the bottom in black, that is the current scheme. So you can see that for comparison. Um, what you'll see there is that we're proposing an increase of 2% in the union's annual income, an increase from 23.5% to 25.5% um, be allocated to branches in the funding scheme going forward. Um, because that's a percentage, it varies according to the union's annual income, but on our 2019 data, that would have equated to approximately £3.3 .3 million um, in 2019. We've divided that into two elements, and the two elements are first and foremost the branch funding formula, which um, will be obviously be familiar to a lot of you. We currently pay 23% um, to branches. We're proposing to increase that to 23.5%, so that's a half a percentage increase. And we're proposing 2% goes to a new branch support and organising fund. This would replace the regional pool and it's seen as absolutely integral to the overall package that we're proposing to the Special Delegate Conference. The fund is new, but as a comparator, the regional pool is funded at half a percentage. So this is a one and a half percent increase or a fourfold increase from the current arrangements that we have in place for the regional pool. We did do a briefing specifically around the branch support and organising fund. So I'm going to focus the information I'm giving to you all this evening um, on the branch funding formula. If we move on to the next slide. Um, this just tells you a little bit more about what the branch funding formula looks like. So first of all, all branches will receive a basic or standard entitlement. And I'm really pleased someone's doing the clicking. They're just going to have to keep up with, um, as I mentioned, each new entitlement. And we'll hope they all pop up in the right order. But um, the first one is branches. All branches will receive um, a basic or standard entitlement. And that is, has increased from 20% to 21%. And that's the first change. Next, the branch funding formula calculates a bran um, branch's additional entitlements, and that's achieved by measuring the circumstances within each branch. So it's a separate measurement for every branch in the union. We have retained the same five measurements. However, we've changed the weighting or value of two of these measurements. So the first is low reserves that you can see on your screen. We've increased the maximum a branch can receive under this entitlement from 2% to 7%. The next element is multiple employer, and we've changed this in two ways. The first is currently in the branch funding formula, you need five members within an employer to have this measured under this factor. And we're proposing that we reduce that from five members to three members. Also, the maximum a branch can receive um, has increased from 2% to 5.5%, and it now measures branches organizing across 400 plus employers rather than the current 50 plus. And there's three elements that are staying the same as the current branch funding formula. They are in order membership entitlement, which remains at 4%, geographical spread at 3%, and low subscription, that is if a branch has um, a higher than average number of low paid members um, in the branch, that remains at 2%. The entitlements that we've changed, low reserves and multiple employer, that was really in response to consultation and feedback from branches. We're also seeking to introduce a new general fund regulator. This will be set at four months of branch funding, and that's currently measured at £12 per member. So branches that have reserves above the general fund regulator can have some or all of their additional entitlements restricted. That's the same as for the current branch funding formula. However, we have reduced the measurement from six months to four months, and that would reduce some branches back if they had all of their additional entitlements restricted, that would reduce some branches back to 21%. However, furthermore, branches with reserves above the reserves and um, the upper reserves limit can have their income reduced on a sliding scale back to 20%. This equates to the minimum level of funding that branches can receive now. You will have seen if you've um, read the report or motion that we're also proposing a very high reserves restriction which will apply from year four um, 2025 if this is accepted by special delegate conference and that is for branches with very high reserves that is their reserves away above and beyond the upper reserves limit I was just talking about and they could see their income reduced to 19 percent. 
The tables that accompany all these calculations that I've just mentioned are set out in the report in motion. So there's an opportunity for all delegates to have a look at them. I'm not going to talk you through all of them here tonight because um, I think it would just become unwieldy and possibly unhelpful um, to the, the whole session. But I hope that gives a fairly comprehensive picture. If we move on to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about this, but I just wanted to give a little bit of rationale about what were some of the drivers behind um, the changes that we've made to the branch funding formula. Under the branch resources working group, we wanted to ensure that we had a funding package and formula that we know was both affordable and sustainable over the entire period that it needs to remain operational. There's no proposed end date for the proposals that we've got in motion 72. If passed, they'll remain operational until it's superseded, superseded by a future national delegate conference resolution. Um, we were also clear that our proposals needed to be equitable to branches. The current branch funding formula has been in place since 2001. It has served us well, but it is now um, getting a little bit out of date and it's no longer full, fully delivering for all of our branches. Hence the fact that this is a debate that's grown in prominence in recent years. We have a situation where some branches are making surpluses um, and that often happens on the same branches on a year on year basis, but other branches have deficits, that is, they don't have enough money to fund their ongoing activities and that's happening on a year by um, year by year basis. And those branches with the surpluses have obviously got significant levels of reserves and those branches with the deficits, if they don't already, they will at some point in the future encounter financial difficulties. So we wanted to achieve a situation where more branches were closer to that break even position and we've got less disparities in terms of the wealth of branches. And I'm going to come back to that principle in a few moments. But um, first of all, I just want to touch upon the transitional arrangements that have been um, agreed by the NEC. This um, process has been a consultative process over the past two years. We've engaged um, with, I think, possibly almost about 3,000 activists directly now um, in the development of our proposals. And we've listened to feedback throughout. And one of the things that um, came to us post submitting the motion to Special Delegate Conference was a need and desire for branches and regions for some transitional arrangements. Um, and we recognise that COVID-19 pandemic has put incredible amounts of pressure on members, branches and activists. And there's a huge amount of concern about about what may be coming further down the road for branches. So if the motion is carried, we want to ensure that we've got some financial security in terms of a transitional period for branches that will apply from 2022 to 2024. What we'll do is we'll calculate branch funding using both the 2001 and the 2021 branch funding formula. And if branches were to receive less money under the 2021 calculation, they'll continue to receive the 2001 branch funding formula calculation in years one to three that these proposals are operational. It'll give branches some stability during a period of what is incredible volatility, and it'll give branches additional time to plan and prepare for any changes that may come later. Um, in addition, um, for those of you who've really, you know, been on top of this and noted it, you'll see that currently the maximum funding a branch can, re um, can receive is 33% under the 2001 formula. Under our proposals, a maximum a branch can receive is 42.5%. So for those branches that do need that extra financial support, would be much better place to provide that in the future. If we move on to the next slide, and this brings us back to our aim of being affordable, sustainable and equitable. When we looked at the bigger picture in terms of branch finances, this is what we saw. And first of all, I should say that just this afternoon, I've managed to go back a bit further and get the data for 2002 as well. And branch reserves stood at approximately 20 million pounds in 2002. We can see by 2023, they'd grown to almost 44 million pounds. And they have slowly but consistently continued to grow in the intervening period since then. So by 2019, there was £47 million in general reserves held by branches. And together with all of the other reserves, such as industrial action funds that branches hold, there was um, just over £65.5 million held by branches in total totality. The extraordinary circumstances of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic, means that last year branches had a surplus of almost £11.5 million. Um, and we know that there's a lot of volatility in reserves, but at the moment that's positive, 
volatility. Um, so branch reserves had grown in totality to approximately um, £70 million, but um, in, on the general fund in one year, they grew from £47 million to £58.4 million. And um, so it was quite a large um, jump. But it means that actually moving forward, while we need to update the branch funding formula, far more branches are operating from a strong financial base um, going forwards. But this isn't the full picture either, because if we move on to the next slide and drill down into the data, it tells us quite a different picture, um, quite a different story. So while we've got few branches that are very, very wealthy, some branches are really desperately struggling, struggling and quite a lot are sort of somewhere in the middle as well. So we've got eight branches between them that have more than four million pounds in their general reserves alone. I mean, that is a massive amount of money and contrast that to seven branches that actually have minus reserves. Um, and so they have a deficit of more than half a million pounds. And then of course, we've got that big sort of middle group um, and we can break that down a little bit further if we need to. But I think that starts to um, unpick when we're talking about wanting something that's fair and equitable for branches, just what the surpluses have done for some branches and the deficits have done for other branches. And we absolutely believe all of these um, situations have occurred through good faith, but it has created a situation where we do need to level that playing field somewhat. If we look at the picture from a slightly different angle, if we look at it on a per capita basis, so per member basis, um, we can see that 212 of our branches, that is a quarter of our branches, um, have more than £160 per member. And if we re remember, we're talking about um, the, the national standard in terms of reserves um, is, is currently set at £16. That's 10 times the national standard um, and a quarter of our branches are at that level. But again, we know there's massive disparities and seven, seven of our branches, again, those branches in the deficit position, they've got, le they've got minus, they've affected um, £35 per member. And then we've got a big chunk of branches in the middle. And they've again, they've got very healthy reserves. They've got between 36 and 81 pounds per member. But there, you can see how um, when we talk about the global figure of branch reserves, they're really not spread evenly in any way, shape or form. I am going to wrap up there and leave it. I hope that's given a lot of you some food for thought um, and provoked um, some questions and thoughts. But before I wrap up and hand back to Becky, I just want to thank all of the finance and the branch resources staff who've supported us um, and have helped get us here today, both in helping provide the data that we've used to make informed decisions about branch funding going forward um, and the branch and the whole of branch resources in general, but also to help us display it um, and collate it in a, with what I think is such an accessible format for people to get their teeth into and use it. And it's much better than kind of the plain tables that my IT skills would have stretched to. So I really, really appreciate the support that we've been able to access um, in order to bring this to you today. Thanks. Thanks ever so much, Josie. Um, really informative, lots of information there. Um, that is the end of the formal presentation. Like we said, we didn't want to do death by PowerPoint tonight, and we're not going to do that. Um, what we want to explore really now is what does that mean for branches on the ground? Um, so I introduced you to four of our activists earlier, uh, Rad, Margaret, Wendy and uh, Denise. Um, who've raised questions and we're just going to spend a little bit of time um, asking uh, asking them to ask uh, Lillian and Josie any questions that they have for their branches or that they've come across or they think are, are, are critical uh, points to the, the funding formula. So uh, I'm going to be really mean and I'm going to start with you Rad uh, because I know you so well uh, and uh, I'm just going to open the floor to the four of you. So Rad, is there anything that you, you know, any questions that you've got that you'd like to put to, to Lillian and Josie? Yeah, yeah, thanks Becky. Can I just confirm she is really mean. Um, so um, I've, I've, I've got, I suppose I've got two or three questions, but I don't want to um, sort of dominate um, the, the asking. So I think my first question is probably what's on a lot of people's minds. And it's um, this figure of um, £12 per head. So we're moving from 
16 pound per head best practice um, member reserves down to 12 pound per head and I think you know that that's that is quite a substantial move and people are going to query the rationale behind that so um, if, if it could be explained I think that would be really helpful to, to delegates to this meeting and, and they can take that back to their branches as well. Thanks Rad. Um, Lillian or Josie do you want to Maybe I'll just um, kick off, uh, uh, Becky, if that's okay, and give Thanks, Josie um, a bit of time just to catch her breath. So thank you for the presentation, Josie. Um, every time we see it, um, you add new figures in because you do the research, you do the investigation, and you, you um, look to find new information to support branches. So thank you for that. The other um, thing I would like to say just to add is to welcome colleagues who have joined us this evening. I think it's really, really important that we get this opportunity to have the conversation. I think your question, Rad, um, has been asked in a number of forums. But I think Josie picked up on that in terms of her presentation. What we don't want to do, uh, and all that we do in, in relation to branch resources review is we didn't want to or seek to destabilise any branch that, is, um, that has budgeted for um, their members in terms of the organising agenda uh, and all the other areas of work that they need to organise around in terms of budgeting, the um, education of members, the education of activists and the like. And Josie's presentation highlighted that within the £12, uh, in terms of the, um, the uh, standard reserve, there is a, a, um, a formula that has been calculated with the finance team that can demonstrate that that gives each branch and every branch four months in terms of uh, how they act, how they actively pursue the budgeting uh, for those branches. So no branch will be destabilised, no branch will uh, be put into pressure in terms of not being able to deliver for members and that four months, um, uh, but that four months uh, buffer gives you the opportunity then uh, to look at how you then uh, recalibrate your budget and formula, recalibrate the budgets uh, and align that to the budget heads that you've identified as, as, as branches as your priority. So what we had to do was we had to look at the, the, the finances in totality. We had to recognise that we had those branches that were really, really struggling. I think they, um, I think to your Josie's presentation really gave us a flavour for those branches that need this additional support that the Branch Resources Review Group um, are prepared to deliver within the package. So it's about sharing the resources around the union. It's about being inclusive uh, in terms of how we deliver finances to each branch. And it's about making sure that the formula is, is affordable, sustainable, hugely important that it is fair and this formula we think gives that fairness and equity across uh, the branches within unison. Thanks Neil that's <clears throat> that's helpful and, um, and and absolutely I'm I'm all for the principle of supporting branches that are struggling at present and, and clearly from from Josie's presentation yeah um, that, that's quite worrying to see how many branches are operating on a deficit at the moment so so any way of of, of um, redistributing wealth, I'm all in favour of, and in, if it means that our branches can can be more effective, then absolutely, because that's what we should be: is effective in supporting our members. Um, so, um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, I have got a couple more questions, but I will give way to to, to other people to bring those in as well. But um, if I if I could come back at some point, I'd really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Thank, thanks, Rad. Um, uh, Denise, Wendy, Margaret, have you got something that you'd uh, like to bring up? Yeah, I'd like to come in. Um, I, I'm Margaret McKee, as said, from the Northern Ireland region, but I'm also chair of the RVH in Lockamore branch, and um, I was vice chair of um, our DNO committee, National DNO committee. So obviously, organising is, <laughs> is at the heart of um, anything I, I do. Um, how is this um, formula and package, how is it going to improve um, organising within the branches um, more so than what we've, the formula we were using before? And um, I'd also like to know 
Is there anything in place to make sure that um, money is used to help organize with them branches and not just to build up more reserves? Thanks, Margaret. I'll start again and I'm sure um, Josie will come in, Becky, if that's okay. I'm just giving you a bit of a break. Um, Margaret, fantastic question. Um, this is what we're about. We're about organising, having a sustainable organising approach. And all the way through the Branch Resources Review, we had that uh, absolutely front and centre, that we wanted to make sure branches had the resources in order to do the organising that they are absolutely able and capable of doing. So how does this formula make that agenda and how, how then can we be assured that it won't uh, add to additional reserves. I think that's simple. I think when we um, looked at the formula, we looked at how uh, we organised within branches, we looked at what the resources were requirement and I think the formula gives those branches, as I said, that uh, affordability but also the um, fairness in order to do that. The other element that's built into this, one of the packages that we had a discussion last week, uh, two weeks ago around, was the Branch Support and Organising Fund. Again, um, some additional resources that will wholly be dedicated to organising. So, um, Margaret McKee, this is right up your street. <laughs> this fund will give you, as a lay leader, the lay autonomy, the lay support within your region to dedicate supported organising activity and initiatives to every branch uh, within the region. It will not be done in a grace and favour. It will be done through strategic organising and planning. It will be done through setting the priorities locally uh, within Northern Ireland. It will be done by branches and their branch um, uh, organising the, the uh, frameworks, setting their priorities. And um, this will be, as I say, something that you can, as a lay leader in, in Northern Ireland in the region, um, be right up the middle of to ensure that that democracy, that accountability and that governance is built into all of this organising agenda. That's good enough for me, Lillian. Thank you. I will just add a few words, if that's OK, um, Becky. And I think Lillian's talked quite a lot um, and really um, about the Branch Support and Organising Fund. I just wanted to touch on the governance side of things. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is we cannot and we do not say to branches, you must spend an X proportion of your income on these specific activities. We don't do that now. We're not intending to do that in the future. So branches will still have the autonomy to make their, their own decisions. However, discussions within VRR sorry, branch resources were spent, meant to stay away from jargon and then we all, you know, launch in, we're every five minutes. But um, discussions within the branch resources review um, really very much focused on while we want to give all this additional support to branches and we want to make changes to the branch funding formula, branches do need a lot of support in various different ways, be that about organising, more specifically about things like budgeting. They need that kind of support going forwards. So really, we need to really bulk up the governance and support that we're providing to branches going forwards. And especially, and um, we come back to Rad's point about um, the level of reserves and how we measure them, the reduction from £16 to £12. Well, um, actually, there has to be some legitimacy to branches saying we're going to have a deficit budget. Um, I mean, what we don't want is branches saying we want to have a deficit budget from every every year till um, kingdom come, because then all the branches will go bankrupt if that's the case. However, it's quite legitimate for, for branches to say this year we need a, a deficit budget. And we had some feedback from branches saying if we say we're going to have a, a deficit budget, we effectively get a computer says no response. And it's got to be much more nuanced than that. So part of that governance support that we need to provide has to be around what in what circumstances would a deficit budget be a red flag as in we think that's going to be that's going to be a cause of con for concern and in what circumstances do we think it's not just acceptable it's actually a positive move to have a deficit budget in some circumstances so we have to be quite clear about um having some distinction between those sorts of issues um and really uh, hopefully pushing branches to do as much with their money as they possibly can um, I just wanted to pick up a tiny little point as well um, about um, the question you asked, Rad, about the £16. 
I think Lillian talked about it in, in sort of the um, sort of bigger scheme types of issues. But when the 2001 branch funding formula came in op into operation, £16 wasn't seen as the goal that all branches were meant to be at, i.e. the minimum. And if they fell below that, um, we were considered them a branch um, in financial difficulty. That's kind of become the narrative in, in recent years. Um, it was £16 was the point at which we said your reserves are getting quite high, we ought to think about restricting them. Um, so this is about sort of turning it on its head a little bit. Um, we're, not, we're not about pushing branches up, we're about branches um, having what it is that they need. And um, if we take a large branch, um, such as my own, we've got a little bit more than 5,000 members, but I can't do it on the exact calculation, so I'll do it on the 5,000. Or if we say my, the minimum reserves in a branch like mine of 5,000 members at £16 um, ought, ought to be, we're saying my branch ought to hold £80,000 in branch reserves and never go below that. We don't need eighty thousand pounds sitting in the bank. It's sitting in the branch um, bank account, never to be moved and ne never to be touched. It's good to have some reserves, absolutely, um, but it, it, it's not healthy for, for for us to say we can't we can't touch that because that's you know just a big pile of protected cash. Um, so we need to, to sort of give some thought to that because that money could be could be utilised in other ways. So that was part of the driver of that. Not all branches are that big. Not all, all branches would need that that much money. But at twelve thousand pounds, that's six, still at twelve pounds. That's still sixty thousand um, pounds that that our branch would ha have in reserve. So it's not an insignificant amount of money by any stretch. Thanks, Josie. Thanks, thanks, Lillian. Um, Wendy or, or Denise, do you want to come back on any of those points or with a separate can question? Just, yeah, can I raise just a few more points, really, um, Becky and? And, and my branch has been um, getting the top ups, but I'm, I'm almost certain that that was only a, agreed on a temporary um, basis, whereas this new funding formula will be on a permanent basis, unless obviously we look at things um, in the future. Um, and um, But I'm also, as some of you will know, the regional convener for Yorkshire and Humberside. And, but more to the point from us really is about the organising fund and how that is different to the regional fund, not just regional funding pool, not just because it's more, but because we can do more things with it. You know, there were particular restrictions on the regional funding pool about employment of staff. Um, now, am I correct in thinking that that's, that restriction isn't there and branches can actually bid to the fund um, and maybe, if you like, uh, part fund some of these posts, which is there on Margaret's point about organising, recruiting, um, etc. And actually doing casework uh, for some of the um, branches where they don't get facility time for the members in the private sector and voluntary sector. And I think that's key, really, for lots of um, branches around that. And, and I think one of the final things is really... Uh, from my branch's point of view, and I'm sure from some of the some others, this has been going on now for over ten years. We've had roadshows, we've had um, various motions at conference. It's never um, we've never had the agreement on it. But I think you know when you're looking at, if you think in branch reserves, something like seventy million pound now. That seventy million is sat there, and and for what? reasons really which links into your point Josie the final thing I would say and I know that these things can be reviewed if we go along I think some of the reserves issues from our point of view is when you're employing staff you really do some often need a little bit more um, in your reserves because we've been pleading for if you like a designated fund for a number of years about redundancy payments or whatever. Now that hopefully isn't going to be where we're at anymore, given the recruitment we got last year and the year before, but it started to slow. And I never want to be in that position, but because we always want to be prepared, I think those are the th kind of things that going forward, if this, is, if this is agreed at the special delegate conference, that's where we should be looking um, for branches to be able to do that as well. 
Thanks very much, Wendy. Just before I um, ask Josie and, and Lillian, I can see uh, one or two hands up. Just to say that I will move on to questions from the floor in a little while. And uh, I can certainly see, Robert, you've put your hand up a couple of times, Robert Prince. So I'll be coming to you first when we get to that stage. So um, don't worry, I, we, I won't miss, miss you out. You're top of my list. Um, Josie, Lillian, um, do you want to come back to, to Wendy's points and questions? Um, I'll pick up the um, issue of redundancy funds um, and then I don't know if Lillian wants to come back on some of the, the organising <clears throat> side of it. Um, well, actually, no, I'm going to mention first of all the 10 years. I, I, I'm certainly ready for us to um, try and agree something around branch resources. Uh, and you know, it's not unhealthy for us um, to take a look at how the, union, the internal workings of the union and make sure that it's fit for purpose. But um, that needs to be a finite conversation, I think. Um, and it would be really good to get some resolution and start to have that more outward looking focus um, because I think there's gonna be massive challenges down the road and that's where we want to be able to put our energies, I think, as trade union activists. But um, if we come onto the redundancy funds, we don't currently operate redundancy funds, although we do know that a lot of branches like to be able to make provision for that should they need to use it. Um, and there's a few reasons um, we, we don't um, operate them, but the main um, reason that we don't is um, if, if a branch is not it needs to make a redundancy and they're not in a position to pay make a redundancy payment that is the sort of scenario where we where the national union can and we expect them to step in and support a branch so if you needed to make a redundancy payment we can, um, can arrange for a branch to get a loan from the national union and because of course then a branch's fixed costs go down because they're no longer paying that monthly salary um, we can arrange a, re, a suitable repayment schedule where they would get that money back. So they have that little bit of a safety net. Um, so, and hopefully, you know, over time a branch would recover and if they've made that redundancy in order um, to address a financial challenge that they've got, they're, um, they're going to be in a better financial position because they won't have those same committed costs. So that's the reason why we don't currently operate redundancy funds. Um, that doesn't mean it's a closed conversation. It's not a proposal at the moment because we think we have an adequate system in place. I don't know if Lillian wants to come back on the branch. Oh, she's got her mic off, so I'll shut up. Thanks, Josie. Um, and thanks, Wendy. Again, fantastic questions. Uh, that we've heard in, in, uh, in a number of forums where we've gone out and, and engaged with branches across um, the union. Let me just start by the first point that you raised around the top ups, just so that people are familiar uh, around that. Motion 126 gave the opportunity for a temporary fix to the branch resources review. And that temporary fix gave branches uh, where it was appropriate through the previous funding formula uh, and the additionality within Motion 126, uh, additional top-ups. So uh, within that motion, it also said that we had to engage 24 lay activists to uh, um, enter into the branch resources review and come back uh, this year to conference with um, proposals. So hence that that was a temporary measure this measure that we're bringing to conference now, Motion um, 72, supporting our branches, will not be a temporary measure. This will hopefully, uh, when it passes at conference, be a solution to 11 years of debate, discussion, and um, 11 years that I know Josie has uh, been involved in from day one. She tells me that our son was six weeks old, he's about to go to high school. What we don't want to see is be here and um, discussing Josie's son going to university. What we want to do is get a sustainable approach to our funding for branches that give them the opportunity to do that and, and produce and, and advance that organising agenda. So how will this look, Wendy, in terms of uh, the funding, the formula, and how will it look in terms of giving those branches the additionality, the additional support to organise? So in the, um, uh, the branch support and organising uh, fund, that fund uh, is there for branches to bid. And again, as I've said, through the priority setting in the region, through the priority setting within branches, within your uh, branch uh, framework, organising framework, you set the priorities and you have the, the ability and the opportunity to uh, 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 get additional funds to support that organising agenda. If a branch decides, and this is why we in Scotland organise geographical meetings, 
What we want to see is branches coming together, pull your resources. You make more from your money when you start to pull your resources collectively as branches. One of the areas in Scotland that we think is a priority, and it's been a priority for a couple of years, and I know it's the same in other areas, is around social care. So when we have health uh, and local authority branches and community branches coming together, we can make a bigger impact for our members by pulling that resource and those branches working collectively, collaboratively, um, and uh, addressing some of the organising challenges. And when branches do that and they want to put additional funds in to support that, then that's absolutely fine because that gives them the opportunity to have some control, some leadership, and a, a huge say in terms of how that, that uh, organising agenda is advanced. What this fund doesn't do necessarily is give branches a dedicated individual member of staff. So we need to be clear about that. This is not about giving branches a, a, an LO, an ARO, an AO. It's about the priorities of the collective union being advanced through the organising frameworks. And for me, that's hugely important. Um, if we go into silos for one branch and we don't take on board the whole collective areas of work that we need to advance, um, I, I don't think that was a proper or a good use of our resources. So yes, Wendy, branches can collaborate, branches can uh, put additional funds in to have greater say and greater influence around their organising priorities. And we will welcome that conversation. And as Josie says, once the governance frameworks in place, once the information in terms of how to access the funds is fully in place, we absolutely know that the principle that we are establishing is the right principle, that the governance that we need to put in place will be lay led, and again, the right principles. So I just think that this is a real opportunity and why would we not grasp this with both hands? Thanks, Lillian. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to come over to Denise because you've been sat there waiting patiently um, and obviously listening to everything so far. So Denise, is there anything, uh, is there anything from your end? Yes, I have just two questions. Thanks, Becky. My community branch in Wales, who has almost 5,000 members, with some working outside of the main employer and some working for the private companies. Why was there such a focus on multiple employers in the new formula? And what difference will this make to branches and the fragmented workforce within members in a community service group? Thanks, Becky. Thanks, Denise. Josie? As I said, it's a nice technical one. Um, I, I mean, th there's huge organising aspects to it, effectively, um, as well, really. But if we talk about it from the technical side of things, Denise, I think the first thing that um, we all do recognise, um, I think when I say we, I don't just talk about, you know, the branch resources. I think the union as a whole recognises that, um, well, two things. In 2001, our community service group did not exist. And most branches were single employer branches and multiple employer branches were more the exception. Now that's been turned on its head and single employer branches are the exception and most of our branches are multiple employer. Um, so we know the branch funding formula really particularly has badly served community branches because their needs, their particular set of needs wasn't on our radar in 2001 because as a service group, you, you hadn't been created yet. So, um, and also the political landscape and what that's done in terms of outsourcing and privatization has meant all branches, not just those branches that are exclusively community members are organizing across, in some cases, multiple service groups, but in nearly all cases, we're organizing across employers that are not part of the core employer. Um, and I, I don't like it when everybody talks about their own branch, but for, um, for comparison's sake, I think um, it's worth saying a branch like my own, our core employer, is the, is, um, is the council. Um, but then we have, um, I think, I'll get it wrong now, but I think we have approximately 300 external employers um, and they represent out of our 5,000 members, about 1,200 of our members. So, you know, they're massive, um, diverse, some of them very big, some of them very small and multiple employers really, I think, has risen to prominence because 
that fragmented system is so prevalent across all of our branches now that um and it and it puts um greater pressure on branches it's um you know it's more difficult to service those members it's much more difficult to organize those members those employers are often much more hostile and so really what we want to do is recognize that extra pressure that it's putting on branches and give something more to branches so that they can better organize those members in those outsourced areas what we think this will do is because I think every single one of our community exclusive branches in unison is organizing across more than 50 employers, is I think it'll start to give more funding to those community, um, the, not just the community exclusive, exclusive branches, but those branches that are across multiple service groups that include community. I think it'll start to give more funding to those branches because at the moment you can get a maximum of 2% and in the future it'll be a maximum of 5.5%. So I think a lot of those branches will start to see that they're getting 3, 4, 5, maybe even the maximum 5.5% from that one factor, which you know, that alone could potentially increase a branch's funding by a maximum of up to an additional three and a half percent going forward. I can't guarantee it. No promises for your, your own branch. I don't have individual branch stats here, but that is what it could mean for those sorts of branches. So we do think this is a huge benefit for community branches. Thanks, Josie. It's about time the community was uh, recognised and... Um, you know, it is one of the fastest growing sectors. So um, it, it's good that we're going to get the support there. Thank you. It is the fastest growing sector. And unfortunately, unless it, political decisions in this country don't change, that's likely to continue to be the case for a very long time. That's why, of course, our, our organising work is so critical as well. Can, can I just ask, sorry, uh, before we were talking about... Uh, sorry, the, can uh, I... Can I can I just say, we'll move on to the Q&A, like I said. So we're just going to round up this, probably take one more question. And Christina, is it? Yes, Christina. Yeah, I'll, okay. Um, yeah, well, I've said I'll, I'll come to Robert in a short while and then I'll come to you, Christina. Okay, so I'll, I'll pop you on my list and we'll make sure you uh, you get your question in. Okay, so you're on my list now. Um, should we take uh, one more question from uh, our group and then I will open it up to, to the wider audience? Um, okay. as, can I come in, Becky? Um, yeah, Rad. So, um, yeah, just I'm gonna I'm gonna ask what's probably gonna be considered an awkward question. Um, no, no one ever comes to these to be popular. Um, so, so obviously, you know, I appreciate we've had the rationale for the proposed reduction in in reserves, and and you know, I think that was really helpful what Josie said about why the sixteen pounds um, figure was introduced. That was really important because I was unaware of that. So, so that's, you know, we really appreciate that. And I'm going to talk to my treasurer about that and see what else we can do with regards to it. But why, when, when you were looking at our at branch funding, a lot of branches are saying, you know, we don't, we, we don't want to be involved in anything bigger than just our branch. So why not just throw money at branches? Why not give branches the money that they're asking for? So, you know, double my funding, triple my funding, quadruple my funding. Um, I, I, I know that's simplistic and I know it's it's probably not sustainable, but that's, you know, people will be asking things like that. So I think it's important to get it out there. I don't know if Lillian so, wants to Yeah, can first. I start, Josie? Um, and, and obviously Josie will come in um, behind me and correct me when I go wrong, as she normally does. Um, Rad, I think um, that's probably a question that maybe is on people's minds. Um, I don't know if it's on everyone's mind. I think it, it's absolutely right to ask. Um, so why don't I just um, protect myself? Why don't me as a branch secretary just say, I don't care what happens round about me. I don't care what happens in the next branch. I don't care what happens in the other employers. I just want my members to be protected and to protect them. I need more money to do that. And I want all the money so that I can vote Squirrel it all in and have it just for my branch. So we are a trade union and we have principles of collectivism. We have principles to support um, the uh, strongest, the weakest and in the middle. So if we then revert back to let's give the branches only what they need or let's give the branches all of the money they want rather than doing a collective across the whole of our organisation. We have a fantastic regional um, set up where we've got that regional support. I mean, you go back to the survey, our branches said money came third, firstly. We wanted more time. So this package gives you 
um, elements in the package that gives you a focus around more time, more, more time uh, around the facilities agreement that we will um, go into in terms of negotiating that strategic facilities agreement, more time in terms of the uh, IT software that we will update, more time uh, with the additional support from the region. So to get that additional support from the region was a, a number two priority and value within the, the survey that we did. So it's important that we make sure that's resourced. So the formula and the, um, the whole package resources that. We have a fantastic, the envy of the world um, on our uh, national uh, work that we do around the legal um, work. So some of that legal work has produced significant wins, not only for Unison and Unison members, but across the movement. Across the movement, um, where we've, uh, through funding our legal challenges in court, have secured significant wins for the lowest paid in our, in our sector, um, that will allow them to go now to employment tribunals without those fees being allocated to them. That's not just for Unison members. That as waves and as ramifications across the whole of the trade union and labour movement. So I think collectively our survey told us, you know, sound like a, a TV programme now, um, our survey told us when we did that survey that our branches wanted more time, more regional support and money came third. And I think that's the message that we need um, to get out to uh, 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 in this uh, conversation tonight. It's not about individualism, it's about collectivism and leaving nobody behind. And this package absolutely delivers. It leaves nobody behind and brings us all collectively onto a, a better footing. Josie, I'll hand over to you because I'm sure you'll collect. Uh, there's virtually nothing to add because I think um, Lillian said absolutely, you know, everything. I think, you know, what's anathema to me is this individualism. We're trade unionists, we're about collectivism. It's part of our core beliefs. And I think, you know, we're not a federation of, of branches. We're one union. And I think if, if, if we leave, you know, one branch or a handful of branches to fail, um, because we all just want to protect our own, actually we're failing as a whole union. And the reality is, while the global figures look good, we know there are branch, branches. What I didn't say in the presentation is those branches that have got deficit funding, um, we know they'll be operating in, an, in a number of ways. They are probably spending things like their industrial action fund to meet their ongoing costs. Um, or some of them are possibly have come into regional supervision because they've effectively gone bankrupt and we're trying to help them get on their, get, you know, get up and running again on their own. Um, so there's, we, we, we can't just ignore those branches and leave them. What we need to do is bring them in and support them. And that's, um, that, that's about that collectivism um, and things like that. So I think, um, you know, Lillian, when she talked about kind of what as what we do when we work together nationally and regionally, some of our organising priorities. I know this is um, more of an England specific example, but unfortunately I am English. You'll have devolved nations, they'll have their own examples, I'm sure. But things like um, multi-academy trusts in schools, you know, you've got those, those span whole regions They go further than a region sometimes. And you can't just get a good agreement in one local authority area and expect that to kind of ripple out. You've got to organize on a regional basis to achieve um, things like facility time agreements, collective bargaining agreements, things like that. So that has to go beyond um, single branches. But to touch on not just the survey that we did, because when funding came third, I think a lot of us were quite surprised because well, I was, well, people have been telling me for years they don't have enough money. Why? I, I couldn't believe it, it had it had came third um, to things like more regional support and more time. So we did focus groups and what, you know, the focus groups was only with 15 branches. Um, it wasn't with the whole union, but they were all telling us the same tale. And really what that tale was sort of saying was, you know, if the union gives our, our branch the support it needs, and that's what we've tried to do with the overall package that we're offering, we don't necessarily need more money because what we're going to do with the money we get is use it to get the support that our branch needs to deliver outcomes. Well, actually, if we can just have the support, 
um, to deliver the outcomes we need to deliver. We don't necessarily need them need more money because actually what you're doing is you're taking out one step of the process and um, you're making it much easier for us to just do the job we need to get on with doing in the first place. So I think um, that's part of it. And I suppose, um, you know, we'll know um, next week whether or not um, you know, the argument of collectivity and solidarity is one that can help us deliver for all branches or not. Pretty really positive note there to end on, Rad. No, no, no. I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it, taking it. I, mean, I think um, what, what um, Lillian said about <clears throat> what we've achieved nationally is, is a really important thing to remember as well. Um, but, you know, I, I had to ask the question because I think it is an important question and, and, and probably okay. other people, it's on other people's minds as well. Um, and, but, but really appreciate both of your answers. Thanks very much. Thanks, Rad. Um, thanks also to, to Margaret, Wendy and Denise. Um, I have uh, had five indications from the floor for questions. So I'm going to take a couple at a time, if that's all right, Josie and Lillian. Um, just to say the questions that I've got on the order. So I've got uh, Robert Prince, I've got Christina, and I couldn't see your surname, I'm afraid. Then I've got John Hughes, James Robinson, and Sonia Howard. So if you've got your hands up um, and I've called your name, then you are on my list. So you don't need to keep your hand up. I'll make sure I, I come over to you. So um, Robert, um, you've been very patient with me. Um, which, uh, well, the floor's yours. What's your question, please? Thanks, Becky. Um, I have two very brief questions, if I may. I'm wondering, um, when all's said and done, when you work out the equations, do we know what proportion of branches are going to be uh, winners and losers? In a very crude, crude question. Um, what, what's the proportion? Is it um, mainly winners? Uh, I was working out for my branch. I think um, we are a small branch. It's the University of the West of England. I'm the treasurer. Um, we're a small branch. We have uh, good reserves. I think for us, it will mean a 1% reduction in 2025 um, and no change until then. Uh, a 1% reduction, of course, relates to going down from 20 to 19%. That's a 1% is actually 5% in terms of our income, what we actually see coming into the branch. Um, uh, what I'm worried about is we have an industrial action hardship fund and we are allowed to put only 5% of our income into that fund each year by the union rules. But we, when we have an industrial action and we need to top it up from our general reserves, we can do. So it, it is good to have those reserves on hand. And even very large reserves don't go very far when you're in industrial action and you're trying to help members who desperately need a little bit of financial support. Um, so from my point of view, it, it has been good to have those reserves in the past, and I know that uh, my branch would be loath to see them dwindle. Um, so <laughs> I'm caught between, I, I appreciate the arguments, and I think perhaps giving up 5% of our income, allowing our reserves to dwindle in order to support the whole of the union, to support other branches who are, who are struggling, is a good idea. But uh, I have to sell it to the branch. And uh, so the question is, how many will benefit? How many will be losers? That's that's kind of relevant to me. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, Christina, if I can come over to you for, for your question, please. And then uh, Josie and Lillian, if you can come back on those. So, Christina. Unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was to get you. Um, my question is: I heard you talking about uh, the um, uh, the fund for uh, uh, redundancy, and I didn't understand well because, in general, when we have redundancies in the, in the branch, uh, the uh, the um, the trust will pay, the employer will pay something that the employers are, are asked to pay. So we manage, uh, we manage to negotiate. What is the reason why there is, uh, the, it's, it's, it's all right it's to anticipate the money, why they are waiting for the money, for the redundancy, what is, um, what is um, the purpose? Because it's interesting, but I just wanted to, if I had to feed back to the branch, I just wanted to, um, to know something more about it. Thanks very much, Christina. Um, Josie, Lillian? Um, I'll, I'll dive in first and then um, Lillian 
um, might want to follow up on a few things. So um, if I take, Christina, your question first, if that's okay, just going in reverse order. Um, so when people were asking about redundancy funds, it's for those branches that employ staff. So it's if your branch employed, if you were making a member of your branch employed staff redundant, it's not if one of your members was being made redundant. Absolutely, that's the employer's um, job to fund those redundancies. But um, I don't know if you're, I think I can recall you from an earlier um, one. That we have an administrator. So we have a full-time uh -huh. administrator. Uh -huh, yeah, but, but it's paid by the trust. Uh, so that's why I'm, I'm interested because uh, is um, in, the trust is paying part, you know, the, the, the main part of it. Okay. So in case, uh, and I know that other branches have administrators just uh, employed partially by the you know the employer and uh, but working full time for unison so how does it work when unison pays the redundancy or the uh, employer has to pay the redundancy i'm sorry I'm, I'm trying to rattle through so that we can get a few more people in it as well christina so um I know when you spoke in an earlier session, you talked about the fact that you have people who work for the trust. They come, um, they come on release, either um, full time or um, sort of ad hoc, and um, part or part time. And you sometimes reimburse um, members or the employer for the time. Those people are still empl employees of the trust, so their okay. redundancy would be if the trust has taken it upon themselves to employ somebody. Um, yeah on you know a contract that states that they're employed by the trust then they retain all those responsibilities as an employer however if your branch has gone out gone through a recruitment process and written a contract for somebody that states that your branch is the employer then you have the employment relationship with that individual and so if that individual was going to be made redundant obviously you um, the, the the duty of the employer would fall on your branch in that instance we know there's branches up and down the country have got all sorts of arrangements that take, you know, a bit of one side and a bit of the other side. Um, and um, I, I think probably most years we'll have a conversation with a branch that identifies a new relationship that we haven't encountered yet. And so we find a way through that. But those are the most common ones, either people who are employed by the employer and have release or have an actual contractual employment relationship directly with a branch. Um, I'm going to go on to Robert's question now. Um, so how many branches um, gain and how many branches may not? Well, I don't have the, the specific figures to hand on that, but I think it's important to note we talked about the transitional arrangements. There are no losers whatsoever in years one to three. That's an absolute guarantee that um, no branch will receive less funding in years one to three. It's about what happens in year four. And um, I can't predict that. That's the, because it's, it, it's too far down the road in some respects. Um, it's a movable feast. I think it's really, really important that, that we remember this. So what we do um, without hopefully getting too techy is we calculate a branch's um, funding um, each year based on the information we know about them. We get most of that information from the annual financial return that your branch submits. We get a little bit of it from RMS. Using that information, we calculate your branch funding. And then next year, we do your branch funding calculation again. So each year it's recalculated. What that means is if between now and 2025, brand, um, a, a branch has very low reserves, but by 2025, it has very high reserves, their funding is likely to go down in that period. However, if a branch um, has got very high reserves now, but spends a lot of their reserves in the intervening period between now and 2025, their um, funding will go up significantly um, at the end of that period. So it's a very, it's very much a movable fee. So branches will be able to make some judgments themselves based on their own circumstances. And I, if I can just indulge um, me just for one more second, I think we're talking about it being equitable and um, you know more branches close at that break-even position. I really don't make any apologies for some of our branches that have you know it's not just more than a hundred pounds per member, more than two hundred and fifty pounds per member. Some of our branches have of saying we should fund those branches a little bit less so that we can give a bit more to those branches at the other end of the spectrum. And if what happens as a result is that some of those branches start to reduce their reserves, I don't see that as, as necessarily as a bad thing. And of course, if branches bring them down to, um, to within um, the level um, 
below the upper reserves level, what will happen is their income will start to go up. And if they continue to reduce their reserves, their income will continue to go up. If their reserves sort of plateau, then their, their income will effectively plateau and then they'll be hitting the break-even position each year. Um, if they start to grow their reserves because their income goes up again, what will happen is that their income will, will then dip a little bit again. And we've done it so it's finely balanced like that because we want to bring branches closer to this, to this break-even position. So um, I don't know how many branches will gain or will lose, um, apart from we know that there will be absolutely no losers in years one to three. It very much depends on the financial position branches find themselves in come 2025. Um, oh, the Industrial Action Fund question, my apologies. Um, so a few things, unless we have national um, industrial action, the reality is, I don't know how many disputes your branch has been in, um, involved in in recent years, but um, I, I know from personal experience, both um, as a branch member, but also um, from having sat on the NEC's industrial action committee, whenever the um, whenever branches have disputes they um, can send out an appeal if it's appropriate to other branches across the union and um, branches are generally pretty generous in terms of sending donations so if your branch was involved in a dispute absolutely you can put money into your industrial action fund if that's the right thing for your branch we have those rules to, for um, precisely, precisely that reason but you can do an appeal if you need to, and other branches will send money so that your branch is able to make hardship payments and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think while I accept kind of what you're saying, I don't think kind of the need for those industrial action funds is one that's going to destabilize too many branches um, immediately. I think this is off the top of my head, so it might be out a little bit, but I do think um, branch and um, industrial action funds are around about the 13 million pound mark at the moment collectively of course some have none some have massive ones the branch Nash the national industrial action fund I think is around about 19 million pounds um, currently and we have um, a, we have a resolution that was passed at conference a number of years ago that said each year one percent of the union of the national union's annual income will go into um, the national industrial action fund and so of course we continue to do that so if we are hit with disputes we do have very healthy industrial action funds so we feel adequately able to support branches should we need to mm. thanks may i come back just very briefly yeah just for, yeah very briefly robert thank you uh, I'm worried that um, if our fund, if our general funds go down, that we might be uh, more reluctant to actually give help to other branches. Um, that's so perhaps the appeal might not be as effective as it previous has been. We're a very generous branch uh, when, when it comes to giving to other people's industrial action, but uh, I, I wonder whether that will continue. Thanks, Before. Robert. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> if I can move us on, uh, John Hughes, you're next, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> I think Robert Price, uh, when he was when he was talking about uh, when he first started speaking earlier, he I think he highlighted the point that I was going to raise the question I was going to raise. We speak about um, the minimum percentage being twenty percent uh, going to twenty one percent, but because of reserves, it, et cetera, uh, some branches would actually go down to 19%. Is that correct? And, and is that the, the lowest percentage that would be classed as, as the standard um, percentage retention then? I have got uh, a question for a regional question, but if I can leave that to later, if, if you can indulge me, Chair. But as I say, the, the main question is about the 19%. Thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if we've got time. And if, if we have, I'll, 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 I'll bring you back in. Um, James Robinson. Yeah, I'm, I'm James Robinson, plant secretary of Knowsley Local Government Plants. And I also held the position of plant treasurer for a number of years. And my question is, is around the democracy in relation to this. And I know this has been going on for over 10 years, but there's a reason for that. Is because this, uh, as I understand it, is going to be the biggest financial decision that our union has made since its existence. And for us to take this motion and decision at this conference, at this year, the first time ever we're going to be running it virtually, it, 
I, I, I want some reassurance around democracy. For example, I've heard that people who put the name down to speak, for example, will be unable to hear the debate. And for, for that to me alone, um, you, you know, is very concerning. And let's face it, you know, this is going to be, without a shadow of doubt, the most controversial motion at the conference here. And given that we've got motion 126, which puts in those transitional arrangements, which from what I understand it, it, it will support those branches that you've made reference to, Josie, that are in these financial uh, difficulties. I just don't see any reason why this can't have been moved and delayed until next year. It would have allowed the review to be complete on the staffing review and allocate resources correctly in terms of staffing. And, and for me, it would have allowed democracy um, uh, to prevail because I, I do have genuine uh, concerns around that. Thanks very much, James. Um, Lillian and Josie, if you want to come back on John and James's points, please. So I'll make a start, if that's Thanks, okay. Um, John, your um, assertion in terms of what the formula will look like is correct in relation to how it stands now. But I think Josie very clearly articulated that this is a flexible um, approach to how we will manage the budgeting process. Year on year, um, your budget is, is calculated uh, in, um, in accordance with the information that you submit. So if it gets to three years time and you um, are in a position where you have significantly higher reserves, um, then that is um, part of the calculation that will determine what your income is for, for, for future years. And I think that's hugely important that we recognise that the NEC have uh, made that commitment to the transitional arrangements, because it's hugely important that no branch is destabilised in any of this process. And that protection or transition allows that to happen. The branches can shape, can budget in accordance with their priorities, uh, within the, the branch organising framework and indeed the regional priorities to ensure that the money is spent appropriately in accordance with those priorities. So um, like any system, James, like any system, it's as good as the information that goes in. So if your information that goes in um, it will then determine what your outcome is. But the next couple of years gives you ample, I think, opportunity in order for you to organise around how the branch um, budgeting is processed and what's the priorities for your branch in order for that spend. So we think that, as I've said before, that the system that we are operating right now needs that overhaul, that the system that, that we are proposing now in terms of the overall package gives, you, gives us that sustainable approach to organising that fairness and equity in terms of not leaving any branch behind and it gives you the opportunity through the transitional arrangements basically to get your branch house in order so that you can maximise your income to the best benefits of your members. Josie, I don't know if you want to cover anything else uh, in relation to John's question. Um, I'll, I'll, could you, uh, no, I'll come in at the end if that's all right, Lil. So can I maybe just, James, thanks for your question um, and thanks very much for, for joining us this evening. Um, democracy within the union is hugely important. Last year, we didn't have um, a democratic voice in our union because we didn't have a conference. And for me, that was a real, real uh, deficit, democratic deficit within the union. Um, I'm a lay member. I'm elected from the region to serve as convener. Uh, and I think it's important that we operate and, and all shapes and guises around our democracy. So each year um, as convener I'm elected um, uh, and last year uh, I was elected using um, the IT and digital frameworks that we've got and that we've been working with over the last 15 months. As a health activist um, I know only too well some of the challenges for our health members and only too well the challenges for our social care members. But democracy is absolutely critical in unison and it's critical that we maintain that. Having this conference um, in no shape or form uh, undermines the democracy of our union for me. 
it makes sure that the democratic voices of the lay members is heard. And if we didn't have a conference with a democratic mandate around the motions that will be debated, with democratic outcomes from those motions that are debated, I think we would be in a poorer place as a trade union. So democracy for me is hugely important and it's important for me that we have this opportunity to debate, to consider uh, the branch resources review motion and importantly, the other hugely important motions that are coming to this conference. We have gone through um, a pandemic that has shook the world. Our members have carried uh, and supported and kept safe our activists. Um, our activists have kept safe our members and our communities. And we need to hear from those members. We need to hear and debate and discussion through that conference, what it was like through COVID and how we recover through COVID as well. So it's hugely important for me that we get that opportunity. This conference is not about one motion. This conference is to hear the democratic voice within our union. And that democratic voice comes from the lay members that have gone through the most horrendous, horrific year ever within our union to support our members. So I don't see this as a democratic deficit, uh, James. I see this as, as us as organising in the best possible way we can to hear the voices of members and to advance the policies that are democratically decided at a conference platform. So I, I disagree with you, uh, James, but I'm, I'm more than happy to have the conversation with you offline um, around this and more than happy to have further discussion. I know we're really short of time and I know that Josie will want to come in uh, on those two points as well. Um, but I, I, I fundamentally agree, uh, support that we need to hear the voices of our branches. And this is about COVID, the recovery, the issues that our members of our branches have had to work through, our activists and our members, and about, yes, a significant review of our branch resources, which we were mandated to bring to this conference. Remember, Motion 126 gave 24 lay members go away for two years and come back to conference. And we are committed to ensuring that we meet that mandate. And that's why we're having this debate at conference. Thanks, Lily. We, uh, we, we have only seven minutes left of the webinar, unfortunately. So I'm going to go to, I am going to go to Josie for any response. Um, and then I'm going to bring uh, Sonia Howard and Wendy Nichols in. And I think that will probably take us up to time. So Josie. Echi, can I just make a point of clarification? At no time was the saying we shouldn't be having a conference. It was just that we shouldn't we, we should have been delaying the decision on this branch resource review and yet yeah, mo motion 126 did commit to that review but trust me this won't be the only review that will have been extended as a result of the pandemic okay, okay. yeah that, that's the point i was making sorry okay thanks james josie i'll be as absolutely as fast as i can john i think um probably lillian um, answered your your question um, really comprehensively. It's only for those branches um, that have very, very high reserves that would see themselves come down to 19%. Um, and obviously, if they bring their reserves down, it'll, it'll go up again. Um, I just will come back um, to, to James James's question. The Lillian's last point, I think, is probably where I'm going to pick up. The working group, the branch resources um, working group, were unanimous that we should take our proposals, that we should deliver our proposals on time. Um, this discussion about should we delay them um, really is, is very, very new and has only really arisen since I think the NEC agreed um, that we would run the virtual conference and that we would um, um, and that we agreed the motion. But um, prior to that, BRR was um, always consistent in the view that COVID should not delay the outcome of this review. And so we've been consistent in that. But I think the first thing is, why are we having a conference if it's not to make decisions? Um, that's that is you know one of the primary purposes of our conference and virtual special delegate conference physical national delegate conference the core of that remains the same is to make decisions about the future um, direction of the union and that's what we intend to do but just um, a, a couple of a bits of information um, not just for James but for everybody out there the delegate registration numbers that we've got for this conference this year are actually higher than the number of delegates we had registered at our conference in 2019. So I don't think it represents a democratic deficit. There is in fact the potential that we'll have higher participation at this conference by virtue of the fact that um, 
people don't need to, to incur the same sort of expenditure, take the same amount of time off work, um, you know, all that traveling time um, is uh, being reduced and we've got more branches and delegates registered for this conference. So I think it presents us with some opportunities as well. But also we didn't want to delay our proposals. We think we've got good proposals um, and we want to be able to implement them if conference supports them as soon as possible. We didn't want to sort of put them on a shelf and dust them off um, 12 months later. Um, we, we believe in them. Um, so we want to be able to give that support to branches. On the issue of a staffing review, we know the incoming General Secretary, Christina, has absolutely committed to that staffing review taking place, but it's not going to be, the outcomes won't be delivered overnight. We can't delay branch resources to wait for a staffing review. Um, there's two things. It's not guaranteed that a staffing review is going to re result in savings um, to be diverted into branches. We don't know if a staffing review will um, result in the um, national and um, regional staffing complement costing less, the same, or potentially even more. We don't have any of that visibility at the moment. But I do actually think there's also some benefits to implementing our proposals prior to a staffing review, because these um, changes that we're proposing have the potential to be quite transformational in terms of the organising strategy in regions and in terms of how that support is delivered to branches. And depending on how that's implemented, and I'm sure there'll be variations across regions, I think it has the potential to impact on any decisions that come out of a staffing review about how regional structures and support to regions can be tailored to complement um, in all areas. So there's the potential that our proposals could impact on the outcomes of a staffing review. What we wouldn't want would be for the staffing review to take place, then our proposals get implemented and the two jar. This way they can complement each other by, um, by coming um, sort of one after the other. And so, you know, fingers crossed, I think now is the right time. And I think um, while we would have all preferred a physical national delegate conference, I think um, the weight, I think, is really to detriment of branches if we don't if we don't deal with it now. I'm sorry, that probably wasn't quite as succinct as I'd intended, Becky. No, that's fine. Th thanks, Josie. Um, I uh, I will bring Sonia and Wendy in. I realised we were coming up to seven thirty, but obviously you you have. Um, have Becky, you don't that. need. Sorry, Becky, you don't need to bring me in. It's been answered. I'm not going to bring Wendy in under any circumstances. Uh, so, Sonia, I'll, I'll bring you in now, please. Thank you. I, thank you. Thank you, Becky. And uh, I'll be as succinct as I can. Um, I, I, mean, I, I mean, I've listened to two sessions now and there's a lot of detail in this. And I mean, I, I mean I, I'm in favour of it and I was in favour of it a couple of years ago, but I think more so now because of the pandemic and I think because of some of the things we've talked about, the pressures on branches, uh, the fact that it is, let's be honest, it is a bit of an unequal situation where branches can stockpile money and other branches are barely able to, to get resources. So it feels that just that alone, if our members were given those choices, I'm pretty sure I'd know what they do. Uh, I think democracy, well, democracy is whatever you want to make it, isn't it? Whatever your opinion is, if you think something's not going to go your way, then it suddenly may not become terribly democratic. But my real fear is this, is that there is a lot of detail. And my worry is that the message may get lost in that. And, that, and if there are people that are hanging on to what they perceive to be their money, and I've had retired members tell me, and I'm a branch secretary, or I was branch in branch, show now, tell me that it's their money when I was branch secretary, uh, because they, you know, that was money that they kind of, you know, what, you know, what into, and other people. And I was just amazed that anybody would think that because Unison is not about silo, it's not about your money. And I think, I think there's a job to do, and I'm really hope it's going to be successful this time, but my fear is, is getting that message out to as many ordinary members on the ground, but also in terms of regions, because, yeah, that's a concern. That was all I was going to say, but thank you for hearing me. Thanks, Sonia. Can I, Lillian or Josie, do you want to respond or, or comment on? I'm not sure there is much to say. I mean, I, I think we all recognise what Sonia was saying. Um, you know, it, there is there is a lot of detail. That's, you know, why these things keep overrunning, because it's hard to get across all the information in such a short amount of time. 
Um, but we are trying our absolute best. We're doing it in through all sorts of, they're all virtual, but we're doing it in all sorts of different arenas. That's why I'm losing my voice today. Um, and we're trying our absolute best. At the very, very least, our most basic level was delegates need to know what it is they're voting for when they turn up to the special delegate conference. I also believe that delegates um, ought to vote, and vote in favour of the motion. It's not perfect. We're not pretending it's perfect. But the reality is our branches are so diverse that I'm not sure there is a perfect solution. None of us have identified a perfect solution because perfection for one branch doesn't meet the needs of another branch. But what we think we've managed to deliver is undeniable improvements for all branches. It just not might not be the utopia that some branches um, are hoping um, that um, that we could have delivered. What we would say is, um, let's take what we've got on the table here. Let's all realize the benefits of the improvements that are on the table here. And let's keep striving to improve, not just our branches, but our, the, the regional basis of the union, the national union. Let's all keep delivering those improvements. I hope the message isn't lost. We've absolutely pulled out all the stuff all the stops to talk to members and activists in absolutely every and any forum the let um, myself, Lillian, Samson, and any of our other um, activists um, from across the whole of branch resources. We've tried our best to make sure that our message has got across. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll keep trying, Sonia. Thank you. I have no doubt you will. <laughs> Thanks ever so much. Um, thanks for that. Thanks for all your questions. Um, if you've got any questions or you think of them, then obviously I'd encourage you to join us on Thursday, um, which, like I said at the beginning, the details are on the website. Um, I will be playing Fiona Bruce for that one, which I can't wait for. Um, so, yeah, if, if anything comes to you, then obviously reach out, uh, come along on Thursday or reach out through your branch if you've got any questions. There is a there is a contact email address on the website if you have questions as well, but don't want to raise it in this forum. So thanks ever so much for your time with us tonight. Hopefully that's given you some more insight and information for you to consider. Um, thank you to Josie and Lillian for, for your knowledge base and sharing that and taking the, the, the time to give comprehensive answers. Um, and also thanks to the, the Unison staff and also all the support staff for helping us put the event on tonight so um thanks once again uh, i hope you have a, a wonderful evening um and as you leave the the webinar as i said there'll be a second poll coming up so if you could take the time to to complete that it'd be much appreciated and we look forward to seeing you on thursday if not we'll see you online josie just one last word i'm really really sorry for james i should have said but there's too much and I can't always get it all out. We did a test on the conference this afternoon, the, the special delegate conference. Um, everybody who's speaking at the conference will hear every, every other speaker as well. It won't be blind for anybody. You will all get access to the whole of the conference while you're waiting to speak. Thanks, Josie. Sneaky. I hope that's reassured. Literally, literally throwing facts out. You are, you are oozing facts. So appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. See ya. Bye. Bye, everybody.